Were they dreams or memories? Was it the tropical heat or anti-malarial drugs? By night, Mike Kardec's soul wandered through the bloody snows of Korea, the prison-like halls of the Veterans Hospital, the fateful decisions made by faceless officers, a career lost, and with it all thought of home or community. There were no answers to be found in the States, no escape or redemption, but there was a freighter, outward bound to places with no recollection of one Marine or his insignificant war. Borneo came up over the horizon, a mirage of fantastically rugged mountains quickly obscured by ghosts of rain, colonial era towns clinging to the coast, shafts of sunlight cutting through the trees, solid as a slanting bar of glass, rivers, the veins of the island, leading him deep into the unknown. In his dream, the river was an avalanche of roaring water, a boulder strewn rapid hundreds of yards long, where rocks thrust out like broken teeth, whirlpools gaped, and snags of giant tree trunks threatened to turn the canoe into shattered fragments of kindling. Somewhere, though, in a place closer to the waking world, Mike Kardec knew that it hadn't been like that at all. It had been a middle-sized rapid. The rocks were low and the eddies manageable. It was malaria that caused the wreck on the Barham River. Malaria and damn fool luck that had brought him the biggest diamond strike of his life just after he ran out of quinine. Lunging forward, he tore open his pack, grasped the box that held the stones. He felt himself falling, tumbling in the thick rushing green and white. The sky flashed through his vision. The rocky bottom beckoned. Then the river spat him out. A newborn, crying, struggling for air. In the dream, he can see himself lying, half submerged among the rocks and driftwood. In his outstretched hand is an old Dutch cigarette tin, its cover open, the water swirling his diamonds, washing over them, washing them away, returning them to the river from which they had come. The Lachlans had a second floor suite at the Straits Hotel. It was up near the government residence and high enough off the river to catch whatever breeze was blowing at the time. The large louvered shutters had been propped open and much of the town could be seen below treetops rising above a maze of tin and terracotta roofs, dotted by the occasional form of a sleeping cat. By the sofa, several suitcases awaited unpacking, and on a nearby table lay Mrs. Lachlan's purse, her gloves, and a novel that she had been reading. Kardec picked up the book. It was Somerset Maugham's The Moon and Sixpence. She was standing in the doorway, John Lachlan had changed into a fresh shirt and donned his jacket. Before sitting down, Lachlan placed a thick file folder on the coffee table. Helen pulled at a chain around her neck, revealing a silver ring, but empty. The setting stared at Kardec like a blind eye. Helen was smiling. A cloud crossed John Lachlan's features. Mike Kardec examined them both but he examined Helen Lachlan in particular. She sent his thoughts in directions untraveled for many years. Kardak went in with the Mauser up and ready. The long room was filling with smoke and fire was spreading up the south wall. Men and women raced toward the blaze. Some tried to smother the flame with blankets, others to cut the burning thatch and poles free with parangs. A young woman ran from the spreading fire right past Kardak without ever recognizing him as a stranger. Across the gallery, the Lachlans were huddled against a wall, and Kardec ran toward them. Flooring a man who got in the way with a butt stroke from his rifle, Kardec knelt and pulled his knife. John stared at him, uncomprehending. Kardec turned to Helen, cutting her wrists free, and then pressing the knife into her hand, he pushed her toward John. A heavily tattooed Dayak peered at them, then suddenly raised a homemade shotgun. Ingai fired his blowpipe. The Dayak bent over, clawing at a dart in his neck but another man grabbed up his gun. Shot ripped into the floor and drove hot nails into Kardak's left foot. Kardak threw the carbine to his shoulder and fired. Men and women turned from fighting the fire, gaping at the newcomers. He pointed Helen toward Ingai and dragged John to his feet. White smoke and burning wadding blinded Kardak, but he wasn't hurt. From the door, Ingai fired the shotgun at someone Kardak couldn't see. The Lachlans were out. Men rushed with bared parangs. 
Kardak fired into the crowd, barely having time to work the bolt before they were on him. Ingai fired, and tossing the empty gun away, leaped forward, stabbing with the spear blade on his blowpipe. Kardak dodged a cut from a parang and lashed out with the butt of the Mauser. He backpedaled toward the door and fired again. Ingai was down, then back up, drawing his parang, blood welling from his shoulder. Kardak caught a sudden image of Hawaiian flowers. Kabir fired John Lachlan's rifle and the shockwave stung Kardak's eyes. Kabir ran for cover as Kardak shot back, missing. Flames tore at the walls and took the ceiling. Kardak kicked the door behind him open, fired from the hip, and dragged Ingai backwards. On the veranda, John was on the boards grappling with the Dayak who had grabbed Helen. Kardak pushed John out of the way, hauled off and kicked the Dayak as hard as he could in the side of the head. It was time to go, but Kardak turned back. One Dayak, then more, appeared out of the blowing smoke. Flames licked along the wall toward them. Kardak fired, worked the bolt. Ingai blocked a cut with his parang. Damascus steel struck sparks. Far down the veranda, Kardak saw Giroux calmly striding forward, silhouetted against the light. Kardak threw up the Mauser and pulled the trigger. Ingai charged. The first Dayak went down, and Ingai ran on toward Giroux. Several men rushed toward Ingai. He wasn't going to make it. Kardak ran in that direction. Ingai's parang rose, covered with blood. Kardak slammed into the man flanking him, and they hit the bamboo planks. He struck downwards, sideways, scrambling to his feet just in time to see the carbine tip off the edge of the veranda and disappear. Then another tribesman rammed him backwards through the flaming wall. Kardak hit the floor inside the longhouse on top of the man. The room was spinning. His clothes smoldered. The roof was coming down in flaming chunks, and up in the rafters a cloud of wasps swarmed in panic from the eye sockets of hanging skulls. The Dayak was not getting up. Pulling the parang from the man's belt, Kardak covered his face with his arms and dove back through the hole to find himself at Ingai's side, surrounded by a circle of men with spears, and just beyond, Kabir, peering over the sights of Lachlan's rifle. Hanging from the high ceilings of the Claude Town Saloon, fans turned lazily, flies switchbacked in the shadows, and outside the town lay, stunned by the afternoon heat. Vandover withdrew Kardak's passport from his pocket and laid it on the table. Mike Kardak had to struggle to keep from smiling. He reached into his pocket and placed a diamond on the table, a diamond the size of a small bird's egg, held in a setting of woven leather. Vandover pulled out his glasses and picked up the stone, looking at it closely. Kardak leaned back in his chair, elaborately casual. Kardak had lifted the old man's head by the hair. His blade glinted in the sunlight. Jeru closed his eyes, resigned to death. The knife cut through leather, and as Kardak stood, the diamond sparkled in the morning light. Kardak placed the passport in Helen's book and closed the cover. Vandover lifted his glass.